Uh, let's start. Um, the currently illuminated Montpelier Roxbury <laughs> Board of School Directors meeting will start at 6:30. Um, and uh, first order of business is public comment. And again, uh, public comment is a is a place where uh, the board receives input from. Uh, the public, uh, we're in a listening only mode, uh, but the feedback you give us is very, very important. We also appreciate the perspectives you bring uh, and also appreciate that, that sometimes uh, it can be difficult to get in front of us and tell stories that oftentimes have a personal aspect to them, um, including ones that, that touch uh, you know, your, your, your children or other people that are important to you. So. Um, Anyone in the room who wants to make public comment, please come up to the desk and uh, announce yourself. Uh, my name is Lisa Burns. I've been in the district um, since 2012. I think I am somewhat well known to some of you um, who read my summary posts and I'm a bit of an irritant to many of you, I, I am afraid. Uh, that's the information I've gotten back from your feedback. But I'm here because, well, first I'd like to ask if it will be possible to, for the public to ask questions um, after the data presentation. Will that be a possibility? That is not how we usually proceed. We're definitely happy to you know, have questions emailed to, to Mike or others. So no one can ask, uh, the public cannot ask it's, questions. It's not a publicly open session. Well, usually <laughs> often it can be made, but that's fine yeah. because I am fairly certain that all of you have reviewed the data that's going to be presented and I think that probably all the board members have a lot of questions to ask themselves. And I just wanted to start by saying I do not mean to be an irritant to any of you. I think we all have the same goal, which is top-notch education um, in our district. And I think we all think that's why any of us show up here. It's the most important thing we ever give our kids. and. Um, and I, I believe that in our district we have an absolute recipe for total success. We have brilliant, inquisitive, engaged children. We have wonderful teachers in the district. And I mean almost across the board we have top-notch teachers. And we have engaged and concerned parents. And with those three things I think the academics in this um, school district can be top notch. And I know this board has decided finally to make academics one of the top three priorities for themselves and closing the academic gap. And I am grateful to the board for that. So what I would like to ask is as you all listen to the data presentation and you all have the opportunity to question it, that you do think about what data is being presented to you, what data is not being presented to you, in what format the data is presented to you, can that data be compared to previous year's data uh, in any reasonable form? And I'd like you to think about that as you look at the data. And like I said, I know you all have gone through these numbers and I um, apologize for offending our superintendent earlier today when I said the data was unflattering. Um, she found that disrespectful. I think it would be disrespectful if I called the data flattering, um, but that's a difference of opinion. Um, and I will just say, lastly, this the thing that kind of spun me into action, as I said, I think some of you don't read my, maybe none of you read my summaries, but they are well read and I have a lot of responses from them. Um, but what started me really off was not the track, but it was this, this uh, assertion by you all that there was no significant, no significant academic loss in this district due to COVID. And that just strikes me as so absurd and untrue that I ha was spurred to this year, school year's worth of action. And every parent I have asked and every student I have asked in a neutral way, was there learning loss due to COVID? I have 100% yes there was in this district. And as a starting point for your summer retreat where you will be addressing academics and closing the gap, 
I would like to ask you all to think about if you were sitting in a room with your fellow parents uh, of fellow students, if you would look them in the eye and say, no, there was no academic loss in this district. If your child is having a problem, that's on you because it wasn't our district. And I don't think many of you would be able or willing to do that. And so to do it as a philosophy, whether it's to justify your spending or whatever, um, that comment is problematic. And it is no place to start a discussion of how you want to make academics better in this district. And as we look at this data tonight, there are appalling problems with academics that are apparent, or maybe they're not. I've been told many times that my information by this board and the administration is either anecdotal, or it, I misunderstand it, or I dis deliberately misrepresent it, or I come from a point of privilege because I'm concerned about academics, or that I'm disrespectful because I question the quality of the academics. And I think that um, is not a good place to start. So please, as you hear this data, and, and I will say lastly, when we talk about COVID and its impact on our district and how that's affecting us three years later, Libby gave a beautiful um, uh, talk at the high school graduation last week and Jim was there to watch it, I know, where she said that COVID defined this graduating class of 2023. And yet this board says that COVID had no academic impact on them. I just can't buy that. And I think when you start to assess where we are academically and how we can move forward, starting from a point of honesty is vital and not this self-deception that we can only say nice things. So I would like to see this board ask hard questions of one another and of administration and the leadership because that hasn't happened and it puts us in a really bad place. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, any other public comment in the room? Uh, anyone on the screen? Oh, yeah, please go. Oh. Hey there. Hello. Hey. Hi, I'm Angela Shea, um, and I am a mother of three children in the Montpelier Roxbury School District. And I just want to start by acknowledging the enormous challenges educators in our districts have faced for the past few years as we've had to navigate this pandemic in a time of exceptional social change. As a former educator and school social worker, I know it has not been easy. And I thank you for stepping up to help our community during this time and for your efforts on behalf of our children. And while I acknowledge and celebrate the good work that you've done in supporting our children, I think it'd be disingenuous of me to do so without also sharing the areas where I know our district's coming up short. So places where we could do better and be curious. My children are not intuitive readers, um, and one of my children has a pretty complex learning profile, which means that they learn differently from their peers. And as a parent and someone who cares deeply about education and community, I need you to know that over the past several years, navigating the special ed system and the special education program has been time consuming, confusing, and at times demoralizing. We've been on a very long multi-year journey trying to ensure our child has the support that they need and that they're entitled to. And I'm pleased the district's making changes to its reading instruction using evidence-based methods. This will be helpful for both intuitive and non-intuitive readers. Um, unfortunately, we've had a long road of where we have been subject to inconsistent instruction, not based on research or best practices for students with learning challenges and pretty much subject to non-existent progress monitoring. And while I'm grateful there's change, I still remain frustrated that it's taken so long and I'm concerned about the ability and the time that it will take to repair for those who lost so much. There are times that when we're interacting with leadership about these topics, there appears to be a vibe of general defensiveness, lack of curiosity or respect for the experience of atypical learners and their families. Several board meetings ago, we heard there was no learning loss. However, Twinfield Union, Berrytown, Berry City, and U32 have all acknowledged that there indeed was learning loss in their communities, and they've arranged for robust six-week summer programs at least three hours a day for both general and special ed students. 
if we, invent, if we eventually conclude that there is learning loss in our district, could we just plant a seed to think about a similar program for next summer? Currently, as it stands, our special ed students in the district, if they qualify, are entitled to a 30-minute slot lesson for six weeks and at any point in the middle of the day. And to me, that feels like a pile of assumptions around privilege and resources when you consider that as a schedule and a time frame. We can't continue to hold conversations about equity, inclusion, and mental health without talking about reading and writing. I'm a well-resourced woman, and I can barely figure this out. Over the years, I've met countless frustrated and confused families who invest thousands of dollars in tutoring, online software phonics programs, and outside evaluations to supplement their children's learning. This does not feel equitable. And what about the families who don't know what to look for, or worse yet, who can't pay for tutors? This is a wonderful community, and we have wonderful educators who work hard every day. I'm grateful and I'm concerned. The road ahead is long, and real change takes real time. So I look forward to future open conversations, questions, collaborations, and brainstormings about these important topics. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And someone else? Yes, please come up. Thank you. I have to tell you, I read a story about a woman who was struck with lightning. And as I raced across the field out there, I thought, it's going to be me. Um, I know. Oh my gosh. I know. Did you read the story? No, but I thought it certainly crossed my mind. It was on Apple News. Oh my goodness. Um, I made it alive. My heart might be stopped here. Um, anyway, hello. I know most of you, um, but my name is Lori Duff. And I'm a parent of two children in the MRPS system. Um, and I just want to make a quick public service announcement about Renaissance Star educational testing that makes up the bulk of the educational data at the school board presentation tonight. And um, for people who might be listening or hear this later, um, since 2019, students in our district have been taking the computer adaptive evaluations. And they have great data. Um, both for the school board presentations and for parents who are wondering how their kids are doing. It's not high stakes testing, but it's a broad look at how a child is progressing in English language arts and math. There's even a graph which shows progress over time, and it's, it's actually very cool information. Obviously, it's not the end all be all for what a child knows. And standardized test scores definitely have limitations. They can be easily manipulated. They can be used for different and sometimes conflicting purposes. But that said, it's a great piece for getting a peek at how your child's doing academically. And supporting our children and their academics is the fundamental reason we're all here. Unfortunately, most parents aren't aware that their child takes these evaluations three times a year. And they've never seen their child's results. In our district, it's really hard to know how your child's doing academically because papers sort of stopped coming home during COVID. The school conferences are led by our, our children in a performative context. And due to the structure of our grading system, it's kind of hard to actually understand what something like a 2.75 means on a grade card. So it's nice to have some concrete, clear data about how your child is doing especially when you can see it over time and you can compare it to others nationally. Um, even better, the Renaissance Star Company itself is committed to involving parents in their child's education. They say no matter how you use the data, remember that parents must be involved in decisions concerning their children. And to help in the communications, the assessments come with parent reports. They also say that students perform better when parents and guardians are actively involved in their learning. They've created a Home Connect service, which allows parents to have email notifications and access to scores at home. So why is it that families in our district have never seen the scores? I and other parents have been asking to have the STAR scores released to families on a regular basis. Recently, the administrative team met and Libby sent out an email, which I actually did not receive, but which was forwarded to me from a friend. And the email conclusively stated, Great. I know, right? <laughs> that scores would not be given to families unless they asked for them. The rationale for refusing to release the scores on a regular basis was because the STAR assessment is a screener tool. Quote, the purpose of a screener 
is not diagnostic in nature. It provides overly generalized information and is one of many pieces of information a team may use to decide on the needs of students. Because of this, the district won't be releasing them to families unless they specifically reach out and ask for them. To me, the rationale doesn't actually make a lot of sense because schools screen for a lot of things, but they still let parents know. For example, students are screened for vision problems. The test is not diagnostic, but I still want to know if my child took the test and if they can see. I, I want to, and I have the right to access information under the Federal Educational Rights and Privacy Act. And I urge the school board to discuss this to help find ways to partner with parents around this issue. Transparency and communication are vital pieces of working together in any system. I mean, ultimately though, I'm wondering if the information from the STAR assessment is not valuable and it's merely a screener, then why does it form the basis of the educational achievement data for tonight's presentation? If the information is not important enough to send to parents, why are we spending time on it? Thank you, Laura. Thanks. Anyone else in the room? No, thank you. Uh, anyone on the screen? Uh, if you could raise, you can raise your hand with the little raise hand function, or you can just come off um, or come on camera and wave. It looks as though no one. All right, thank you. Um, you know, thank you for the, the input, that was very helpful. Um, consent agenda is next, and also you want to add something, right, Jill? Yes. Okay. Um, the Finance Committee would like to add to the consent agenda an item that we discussed in the Finance Committee. Um, it's a resolution authorizing the issuance of procurement cards for, um, for our municipality for several um, administrative positions um, to allow for things like registering for conferences and things like that. Um, the expense of processing all the purchase orders is actually pretty excessive when you add up staff time to process the paper and pass it back and forth. Um, and the, the bank that specializes in, and this is the one that all the Vermont um, districts use, uh, requires a formal resolution. So we'd like to add that to the consent agenda. Got a, a second from above. For voting, uh. um, I can read it real quick or I can read it. Uh. So should I just read it now so it's read into the record? Since yeah, sure. Okay. All right, I can read it. Um, so this is a resolution authorizing issuance of individual procurement cards, whereas the board of the Montpelier Roxbury School District has the authority to enter into an agreement with the Bank of Montreal for purchasing cards and, uh, let's see, anything else we want to add? We don't need to. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the board that the chairman is authorized to enter into an agreement with the Bank of Montreal to secure procurement cards for each authorized employee of the municipality under such terms and conditions as approved by the board. Uh, the board authorizes the business manager to execute a P card program agreement on its behalf. That's the resolution. So, great. Any, any questions about that? Are we the municipality? Yeah, sorry, I should okay. have. I just got this a little while ago. We're the municipality for the purposes of this. Okay. Oh, yeah, I apologize. Who's going to get cards? The principals and central office directors. Okay. And are procurement cards like a district like credit a card? card? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Currently, what's happening is we're all using our personal cards and, and getting, they're getting reimbursed. reimbursed. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Will the cards have a limit on them? Yeah, they're yeah. only up to a thousand, I think. Oh, okay. And then they get paid off, and then yeah. so it's like a thousand dollar line of credit yeah. on a plastic card. Okay. And I can't remember the exact number, but the the volume of under one hundred dollar purchase orders that the business office has to process, and therefore the staff has to fill out paperwork to get reimbursed for, it was like two thousand or something More really. Different items. More than yeah. purchases under a hundred dollars, and the cost of the paperwork involved with the reimbursement is about a hundred dollars for each of those things. When you add up the cost to staff to process it, so this will 
save money. Uh, I move to approve the consent agenda with the addition of the resolution from the Finance Committee. Thank you. Uh, a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? I'm sorry, I'm texting. I'm trying to arrange a ride for my daughter who's playing. Oh. <laughs> uh. I have a quick um, just request about yes. the consent agenda. When, when um, letters of res resignation are sent to us, would it be possible to add a position in the building that they're resigning from? Because sometimes I don't know who the person is just based on their name. We can try, yeah. I mean, if yeah. it's not too much. Yeah. Thanks. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Consent agenda passes. Um, next, the board learning focus. Uh, Peggy Sue and Mike and Jess. And Nick. And Nick. Thank you for joining us, Nick. You didn't. If I have you sign this, Libby can help. Yeah, I'll sign this. start. Um, thank you for having us. Uh, kind of a weird night. <laughs> um, we have a, a short presentation that accompanied the board report that you all saw prior. So if there's questions that come up from the report as we're going through the presentation, feel free to, to ask those. Uh, the first slide is the academics. And over on the left-hand side, um, there's an update on our continuous improvement plan goal, which we talked about was decreasing um, the number of students needing tier three supports to no more than 5% at each school. This year was really kind of our baseline year of gathering that data, and you can see the percentage of students that access tier three. Um, those numbers are a little bit contextual though. So for example, at the high school, there's severe limitations in the number of students that can access tier three because of the master schedule and things like that that we're changing for next year. So it's not all apples to apples all the way down through there. Um, but additionally, what we've done is we've done a lot of learning this year from challenges and from things that we've dug into and just kind of want to walk through each of those. Um, one of the big things that we walked away with is needing a better understanding of our readers uh, through diagnostic assessments. Um, so we have worked really hard this year to incorporate a layer of diagnostic assessments that put together a really clear profile of our readers, K through 12. Um, Libby can tell you she walked into my office today and we were scoring uh, spelling inventories and it's just amazing data that can tell us a lot about students and what their needs are. Um, so we're really excited about implementing that for next year with fidelity across our schools uh, and that will give us better information about student growth and is what we're doing working? And that's the information that we really wanna share. Um, uh, the second bullet there talks about that a little bit more, celebrating fo and focusing on growth through data. So Julie Conrad, the principal at Main Street Middle School, actually dug into a lot of the uh, data that we've been collecting and found ways to celebrate students that were, may not normally be celebrated for the hard work that they're doing uh, by showing the significant growth that they've made in their goals throughout the year academically. Um, particularly in reading and math. So we've, we've learned that we need to do more of that. We need to really celebrate those students that are working hard and making progress, but maybe out of level or maybe working at a, a different grade level than they're actually placed in, but they're still working hard and they're still progressing and, and what we're doing to support them is working. Um, so we need to do more of that. Uh, we need to focus on goals and specific skills work for s successful for students. So that just feeds into a lot of the learning we did in Tier 3 this year with our interventionists. Really seeing where when we focus on micro skills and progressions for students, we see progress, success, and confidence in those students. So we need to keep replicating that. We need to keep refining, keep getting better at targeting those skills. And those diagnostic assessments are going to help us really do that and measure it to make sure it's working. Um, we did a, a little experiment this year. Uh, we involved students in setting their goals all the way down to, to kindergarten. 
Um, if you went into the UES intervention space, you'd often see an interventionist sitting with a student and they, before they start a cycle of intervention, they write out their goals or they articulate their goals and they go up on the wall so that the students can be a part of writing the goals about what they're going to be working towards. And we saw a tremendous engagement in that through that. We also did that at the middle school in mathematics and we saw tremendous engagement. So we want to multiply that um, and empower those students to be a part of that. We're making some big changes to Main Street Middle School and MHS structures of Tier 3 delivery next year, uh, incorporating them more into the master schedule of MHS. Uh, one of the big challenges here at the high school was working it into student schedules so that they could see an interventionist on a more regular basis. There were a lot of gaps in times between visits and, and it, it was really challenging for our interventionists and for our students. So we've got an update to that and then at Main Street Middle School we're doing something similar uh, we've been working with a, a few folks, a few different folks, on how to incorporate a more structured literacy opportunity for adolescent readers, um, specific to ad adolescent literacy, and it's, it's been really fantastic. Julie Conrad and the teachers over there have really done a lot of digging in. Um, so we're, we're very excited about that. And we've increased the amount of interventionists at Main Street Middle School by, t by two. Um, Peggy Sue and I spend a lot of time talking and we've got some plans to be able to work more collaboratively between special education and tier three interventionists. It's actually happened quite organically throughout the year and we're excited to really put that into full force next year um, to make that smoother for families, smoother for students, smoother for interventionists and special educators and kind of make better use of the resources that we have uh, to be able to target those specific needs for students. Um, the big work in curriculum land this year was specific connections to priority standards for tier one and tier two. When we're working to improve tier three numbers, we're really working to improve tier one and tier two. So classroom instruction and that enrich and enhance time with teachers. Um, so we've spent a tremendous amount of energy and time working with educators K through 12 on identifying the priority standards, creating proficiency scales for literacy and math. Uh, K through 12, and a little bit of dabbling at pre-K as well. Uh, to be able to articulate that, to also make it clear what is taught when and what are we responsible for at each grade level. Uh, that was big geeky work that I absolutely love. Um, and I'm very proud of the work that everybody put into it. It was a tremendous effort uh, by the schools. Uh, I mentioned a strong focus on adolescent literacy strategies. We have dug deep into that land. Uh, we are working with two resources right now, Dr. Sarah Lupo and Julie Brown, actually Dr. Julie Brown, from Woodstock. And we've been working with those two folks and plan to work in a cohort through CVED C next year with Sarah Lupo. Um, so we're excited to have structured support to work on that throughout the year for both the middle school and the high school. And then a big focus for next year is uh, digging in on diagnostics for math assessments as well. We've, we've done a lot of learning and there's a slide later on that we'll talk about literacy diagnostics, but we need that same level of diagnostic information for mathematics and our mathematicians. Um, so we're gonna be looking at uh, OGAP for Main Street Middle School and the high school and digging back into the PNOA, which is primary numbers and operations assessment for the elementary level. And we're excited to do that. And we, we've got some great math thinkers and some great folks that are going to help us dig into that. Amy Kimball is our instructional coach. Um, it's, she's all, all for it, all excited to dig in. So I'm confident that we'll have some great diagnostic information about our learners in mathematics for next year. Oh, all right. Uh, so I have um, some information here. Um, just a couple of things to highlight. Just looking at... Um, the number of students that we have in the district currently, well, as of June 1st, with um, IEPs. So we started in our November report, um, we were at 115 K-12. Um, as of June 1st, we have 139 students K-12 um, on IEPs. Uh, preschools crept up a little bit from 18 to 23, so that first graph is just showing you that. Um, the graph in the middle, uh, just today I thought, I wonder what 
child count looks like. So child count is collected by the Agency of Education every year on December 1st to look at the number of students with um, IEPs. I was able to go back to 2015. Um, so you can see we are, our numbers are continuing to rise. Um, it, 2015 we were at 119 and again this year we are at 139 so um, there was a little bit of a dip um, but for the last four years our numbers have been climbing upwards um, 504 plans we also have a slight increase not a huge increase over the district but we, those also are increasing in number and then um, the bottom graph is just uh, the number of initial special education referrals that we had this year. So either initiated by parents or um, by uh, school teams um, where the question was asked, should we be doing a special education evaluation? 23% um, of the teams met and decided not to do an evaluation. Um, for different reasons. Of the evaluations that we did, 49% uh, were eligible, 19% were not found to be eligible for special education. So I thought that was interesting information. Um, uh, some celebrations uh, from this year. Uh, we've done a lot of work to align practices and our expectations across the district so that the experience for families and students um, doesn't feel vastly different depending on what school you're at or what case manager you have. Uh, we are working starting next year to create longer relationships for case managers with students and families. So we um, have set up plans next year so that case managers will be with students for at least two years. Uh, in some situations those will be three-year relationships and at the high school we're looking to do four-year relationships so that um, families know the case manager, case managers know the student, they don't have all that time where they have to get to know each other and um, they, you know, can hop right in um, when school starts with services. Um, and as Mike said, a lot of collaboration this year with, between special education with the interventionists and also the SEL people um, so that we're building stronger systems for all students. Um, I do want to do a shout out to the special educators in the district. Um, so with our growing needs all year, just a reminder that we had three open special ed positions that never got filled this year. So they all stepped up to do what we had to do for kids, um, despite the fact that we were down in numbers. Um, so they're awesome and I think we need to make sure that they hear that they're great and that we appreciate them because it's a tricky job and doesn't always feel appreciated, I think. Um, looking forward, next year we are doing some IEP development, professional development with the Ability Challenge in August so that we will have um, more consistency around what our IEPs look like. Uh, this summer we're doing some LEA training for the principals around special education and also Jess is going to do some 504 stuff so again trying to increase the capacity of our administrative team. Um, Big work next year is the implementation of the new special ed regulations, so help making sure that uh, the professionals understand it and also working with families to make sure that they understand the changes and what they mean. Um, the literacy work is definitely something that we've been doing a lot of work on and um, just continuing to build the collaboration. So we're looking for more opportunities for all of our teams to, to be able to meet on a regular basis to talk about kids and practices and all the things. That's it, unless anyone has questions. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'll talk about sort of like HHB behavior and um, discipline, and then I'll talk about um, SEL services as like a separate topic. Um, so as far as HHB and behavior and discipline, um, I think some successes are we've really increased our compliance and understanding of like HHB policy and what it looks like in action. Um, I've gotten a lot of feedback from the assistant principals just feeling like they can move through that process a little bit easier and understand the nuance and can navigate it um, with more ease. We've really increased our use of intentional and consistent use of RP and really pairing um, restorative practice, sorry, restorative practice work um, in a systematic and more intentional and consistent way to pair it whenever we have incidents or violations that we need to repair harm for. Um, and have really started to focus on restorative work and SEL skill building as really the primary driver of how we respond um, to incidents that cause harm. 
Uh, we've done a lot of work uh, with faculty around trauma-informed practices, restorative practices, um, asset-based language, um, and our SAIL professionals have done their first round of collaborative problem solving, which I'm really excited about because I think next year that'll really inform how we respond and how we problem solve with kids around um, behavior incidents. Um, and we've really started to shift our thinking about suspension specifically as a way for us to build in time to be really intentional with um, how we respond to behavior rather than it being the end all be all sort of response to any behavior that may result in that. Um, additionally, I think we've done some really good intentional work around university, universal community building. Um, things like dodgeball is happening, minute to win it. There's dino dances, which are really adorable. If you walk around UES, you'll see kids dancing. Um, so I think that's been a really intentional effort this year. Um, to, so we're not just responding to events, but we're proactively trying to prevent them. Um, I'm really excited to continue that work. We have done a lot of celebrating, breakfast, um, and some really intentional transition work to help students transition to different schools. And I walked into MSMS this week and was welcomed with a bowl of ice cream at, um, as an ice cream social. Um, next year, we're going to really increase and continue training um, our SEL professionals around restorative practices and how to do that work in a way that's really intentional um, and supports uh, welcoming kids and wrapping kids. Um, and we're going to continue the collaborative problem solving. So we'll have another training round and we'll be, the SEL professionals will be engaging in coaching to really implement that in a way that's consistent and with fidelity. Um, we also are going to work to like increase our ability to analyze school and grade level data and respond a little bit more swifter. There's going to be swiftly, sorry, um, there's going to be a new team structure. So we're actually building in an embedding time for teams to look at um, school level data, grade level data, and individual data so we can see trends and respond a little bit more quick, quicker and based on what we're seeing in the behavior data and in the SEL data. Um, and I'm really looking forward to working more closely with Up for Learning and those students groups so we can increase student voice in what our proactive universal community building looks like in our schools. Um, so as far as SEL services, you know, I think one of the successes there is that we are pairing SEL needs with SEL work and services. Um, so students are being matched and really targeted for what they need. Um, and we've really started to create the outline and common language around what our SEL MTSS tiered system support is going to look like. Um, so I think that's been a really good starting point for next year. Um, you know, we're really, the state is really showing um, SEL needs, especially with our younger folks. Um, and so, and I think it's also showing a need to increase our ability to be flexible and cycle kids through services and use data to help understand when we can scaffold student support and what decisions do we need to make when students aren't making progress and are continuing to need SEL interventions long term. Um, so again, we're going to build in a team structure to really look at the data regularly to progress monitor um, more intentionally um, and to help build our ability to analyze that data and use that analysis to inform what we do next with students based on their needs. Um, and then I think this also really highlights um, our need to continue to embed SEL in tier one instruction and figuring out what that looks like. And I'm really excited. We have two really strong SEL teachers who are gonna serve as SEL coaches working with general educators, both in groups of grade level teams and individually to help them really embed and shift their practice um, to embed SEL. I have a quick clarification. So when you say build in like team structures, 
to make sure that that data is being looked at? Is that like building level admin or how will that happen? Yeah, so essentially we're going to have a similar SEL team structure in each of our buildings. Mm -hmm. um, and so for example, there'll be a tier one SEL leadership team composed of like me, APs, teacher reps who will look at the grade level data okay. and then um, one, the teacher rep will go into their grade level team meeting and talk about the data mm -hmm. and what strategy is and how we're gonna respond to themes of behavior that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so I will get to share a little bit of the chronic absenteeism data for our district. Uh, every time I have the opportunity to come in front of you, I get to tell you what chronic absenteeism is again. Uh, so as a reminder, uh, or, or for those that are new, if you, you aren't as familiar, chronic absenteeism is missing 10% or more of the school year uh, in our school district. That's 18 years, or 18 days over the course of the year. Uh, and so this is excused absences, this is unexcused absences, this is out of school suspension. All of those days missed are part of the calculation for chronic absenteeism. The reason we look at the data in this way is that there is a lot of research behind the predictive factors of being chronically absent that hits at being able to read at grade level by third grade, that hits at being on track academically in middle school, and is a predictor of high school dropout as well. So when we look at if a young person is in or out of the building, that's our biggest concern when we're looking at chronic absenteeism. Uh, as a reminder, we, we had um, the, uh, part of the continuous improvement was kind of setting a target of reducing our chronic absenteeism rate as a district, trying to get that number down to 20% uh, by 2024. As we see kind of how the year has unfolded and the way that student engagement has unfolded this year, uh, we have not seen the kind of decrease we would have expected here in our district. And, and really what we're seeing across the country as well is that uh, the, the pre-pandemic levels of chronic absenteeism are not back in the way that a lot of folks were expecting. So we're, we're past some of the bigger quarantines, which we thought were maybe inflating some of our chronic absenteeism numbers, um, but we are really not seeing that quick bounce back in the ways that we had hoped. Uh, so a lot of the work this year, um, from my work, has been a lot of really significant tier three interventions, so supporting young people that are significantly chronically absent, um, really having a hard time just getting into the building for the first time in, in maybe a year or more. Uh, students that are, that are experiencing some pretty severe anxiety about being around uh, uh, other students, um, just being in this space can be really hard. So a lot of the efforts this year were really, again, targeted toward uh, the tier three students um, who may be 20 plus percent, uh, missing school at 20, 20 plus percent or more of their time. So as a district this year, uh, as of June 2nd, we were at 31 percent. So, so it's come down a bit. Um, we've seen the most gains really at the elementary school and middle school this year where we've seen absent, chronic absenteeism at, at UES go from 28 to 24 um, percent. So we are seeing some gains. Uh, at the high school we're seeing a lot more tier three. So we've seen an increase in the number of young people who are missing a significant amount of school. So our tier three uh, students here at the high school when it comes to absenteeism has grown this year um, which we've really been spending a lot of time trying to figure out like how are we engaging these students at the high school level it's a little bit different when we're looking at um, what it means to pass a course and earn a credit right so if a young person is feeling like there's no chance for me to pass this class why would i come to school i'm not going to get this credit why would i come to school so how are we engaging these young people um, is something we've really been coming up against this school year uh, so on the slide you can see kind of some of our student population uh, chronic absenteeism rates so as i mentioned for the whole district, we're at 31%. Uh, for uh, our students of color, we're at 30%. Uh, so students that qualify as, uh, for free and reduced lunch, for example, is something that we, we pull out as a, a kind of an equity indicator. We're seeing those levels stay really high. So we're at 48% as a district. So that means 48% of the young people uh, who qualify for free and reduced lunch are chronically absent. They've missed 10% or more of school. This year we have also seen uh, the numbers of young people experiencing homelessness rise in our district. Uh, and those young people, this is something that uh, we, we've got to pay more attention to. 75% of students who experience homelessness were chronically absent this year. Uh, high mobility, the ability to, um, you know, quite frankly, if you don't know where you're sleeping tonight, how can you be expected to be in school tomorrow? And a lot of our families are coming up against that decision. 
Um, as a district, uh, we work really hard to ensure transportation is available uh, as best we're able. That can also be challenging depending on the mobility of our families and the availability of, you know, a taxi company, a staff member, a, a bus to be able to be there that very next morning when I get a call at five o'clock the night before, hey Nick, this is where we are. Sometimes that can be hard, right, to, to get that. So we see the, the higher rates of chronically absent students uh, with our students experiencing homelessness. So definitely wanted to kind of just note that and, and we, we've got to do better there. Um, and then young people who have an IEP in our district, they're, they're right at the same level as the whole student body, around 32%. Uh, are experiencing chronic absenteeism. The other note that I will put in here is, is I've got the, the graph by grades. Uh, this is kind of as expected, where we see this kind of uh, dip in the middle. Uh, we, we tend to see young people in kindergarten have high rates of chronic absenteeism. Uh, we see that is true in our district, um, with nearly 40% of students in kindergarten are chronically absent. And then it comes back up again in the high school levels because of what I was naming, especially at that, we are in 12th grade, maybe uh, being in school feels a little bit like I've, I'm passing, I've got all my grades, I'm accepted in, into college, like the, maybe toward the end of the year we see the chronic absenteeism numbers grow, go up as well. Uh, so that dip is kind of what we would expect to see. Um, there's been a real focus. Uh, again, we, we've kind of dialed in a bit on kindergarten this year as well in our district around uh, supporting families to really have a good understanding of what it means to be in school every day, coming out of pre-K, being in school for a full day. What does that mean? How are we building that mindset uh, and supporting our families and, and getting their students to school? Um, so I think that's kind of where we'll, we'll put it for chronic absenteeism and as we close out, happy to take questions. Uh, so this is a slide that talks about looking forward and mainly focused on our data landscape. Um, couple of these points we've already talked about, one being uh, you know, increasing our depth of bench in terms of our data. So we have a local assessment plan that's rolling out next year that is comprehensive, um, allows us to get multiple layers of data about students uh, to be able to access to A, know what to do instructionally for those students, but B, also to track progress to be able to say, is what we're doing working? Um, so we're really excited about that. Our current report cards, particularly in K through eight, are not very helpful in communicating student learning. Um, one of the things that was missing from that effort was updated prioritized standards to be able to report out on what our priorities are for students and a way for parents and students and teachers to understand what does a 2.5 mean, what does a 1.5 mean, and what does it mean for my student. So this summer a big project is working with our report card software company um, to update our report cards. And our first initial meeting went very well. It sounds like we can do a lot of the things we want to do. Um, so that's a big, big push for us, is to get those to be useful tools for everybody in that process. Um, most of the changing would be K through eight. Nine through 12 is a little different system, and we have the difference between report cards and transcripts. So that's, that's a little bit of a, an unpacking. But there be some, at least some aesthetic changes to make it more um, visually accessible. There's a lot of text on our report cards. We want to try and use color coding and scales to make it more visually accessible for families that might have literacy struggles or be multilingual. Um, so we're, we're trying. We really want to focus in on that. We are uh, onboarding a, a new data system that incorporates social emotional learning, chronic absenteeism, uh, academics, and uh, behavioral information. We are feeling very um, optimistic about this tool. It has been a, a very smooth onboarding so far. We have a lot of work this summer to incorporate our data systems and our new local assessment plan, so all of that is in there for um, educators to be able to access, um, and we're, we're feeling really good about that. There's some links there to just some general information about the platform, and hopefully in the fall we can share a little bit more about how that's going, um, but so far, after all of us collectively have kind of been through several onboardings by companies that promise us the world, and <laughs> so far this, this has been very, very positive all around. Um, a continued focus on data literacy across schools. We need to get better at data. We know that. We need to get better at understanding it. We need to get better at reporting it. And we want to have that focus across our schools at all the levels. So as Jess was talking about, how our grade level team's gonna unpack data and be able to talk about that. Um, we want to do that across all 
uh, content areas and, and all strategies, um, but also as an administrative team. Uh, we'll get our first look at the VT CAP assessment sometime in August, allegedly. Um, we don't know what to expect. We don't know what that format, that data will come in. It'll be really interesting for us to be able to look at that for the first time. Um, and we'll keep you posted on that. Uh, again, focus on progress measures and reporting over our overall progress. A lot of the data that we report right now doesn't really tell the story of, of progress for students or lack thereof very effectively. Um, so we want to be able to be able to have data that easily tells that story to show again is what we're doing working across all our domains. Um, and then at MHS, we have some strategies in place to improve um, student assessment collection. So we have a bit of a challenge uh, having high schoolers take uh, some of the assessments seriously or take them at all. Um, so we are, we are going to try some efforts to really encourage that, including you know, positive promotion, showing how the data is used, um, incorporating it more into the master schedule so that it's not an optional component or something reliant on students being organized to do that. Um, so we've got some plans to be able to do that to help us make more effective use of the data that we collect at the high school in particular. And then the, the next slide sh shows you an example of where we're going with our data landscape in terms of the content area. So this shows data from broad to specific on what would be our proposed um, local assessment plan. So at the top we have our screeners and state assessments. So those are the broad, those give us that general information about students and learners and who do we need to focus in on to get more diagnostic information. And then each layer as we go down gets more particular to those strategies and skills for that student. And those, those lower layers, those diagnostic layers, really allow us to show progress monitoring for those students and for our collective group of students that are receiving either intervention or tier two. And we can see potentially our impact of tier one instruction, improved tier one instruction across these domains. So this is just a visual to help uh, show the difference between broad and specific data and how we plan to attain that next year um, in literacy. This is a literacy example. We would like to replicate this, a similar structure for mathematics and eventually for other areas as well. Uh, questions? I'll, I'll ask a question. Um, so part of what I think our role is is to also help like parents or folks who might be watching who might not be like quite in the weeds about educational acronyms and data and things like that. I didn't know if um, you could give some examples of what SEL means and then like what SEL incorporated into tier one instruction. Like what is what are some examples of what that looks like for families that don't and yeah, like, thank you. We're so yeah. wrapped up right in acronyms and education, <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, so SEL is really looking at um, social emotional skills, right? So those can include self management, um, time management, executive functioning, self regulation, collaboration, self advocacy. Um, at MRPS, we have looked at like five domains that we have um, for SEL skills that we work under. Um, those are really aligned with the CASEL standards, which is just like we have literacy and math standards, they're also SEL proficiencies. Um, so that is really what those are looking at. So there's like the non-academic skills, and I really frame them as the non-academic e skills that you need in order to be successful in education um, and access your education. Um, so as far as tier one instruction, those are things like when you're having a read aloud, being able to name um, the character's emotion, for example, and how they react, or really being explicit around, hey, I'm feeling a little confused right now. Like, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to reread this. Um, and really being explicit and um, thinking out loud how you navigate sort of the the day um, and challenges and when you're feeling upset and um, how you handle those. So that's just sort of one example. Yeah. I, I have a follow-up to that, if that's okay. Oh, yeah, perfect. Scott is here and I have a question as well. Mia? Yeah. 
Um, can you can you link how SEL is connected to academics? Yeah, so I think when we think about, for example, reading or writing, both of those skills require a lot of self-management and a lot of ability to concentrate, right? So if you can't um, regulate yourself, you won't be able to concentrate and you won't be able to be as an effective reader. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think it just it goes the other way too. So if we have poor access to instruction for a student that impacts their confidence and they may act mm -hmm. out in ways that show us behavior, but are academically based. Mm. So we, we've actually worked together to how do we roll out curriculum in, curriculum in a way that, that is universal. So when uh, teachers see the SEL curriculum, they see it in the same kind of format as the literacy curriculum or the math curriculum so that we, we can access that equally. Scott. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Oh, can you guys hear me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, perfect. Um, so yeah, I'm thinking. I'm thinking about the um, the results of the audit that was presented a, a few meetings ago, and one of the take homes I got from that was that we, as a board, certainly as a as a district, um, can do a much better job of engaging families, um, and and then. Given that and the information on that last slide or the second to last slide about looking forward, I, as a scientist, I really appreciate the increased um, um, like interest in data. And so I guess I'm, I'm interested in knowing how we can better engage families um, in, in understanding the data that we, we hopefully will be collecting going forward. Yeah, so I've got a couple examples. Uh, it's a great question. I think the report cards is one. Um, I'm not a huge fan of report cards, so I won't, I won't pretend to be. I think that there are much better ways of reporting, but um, we have them and people use them and people utilize them, and I think we can leverage those in a much better way to access more information about our students and learners. The other thing that we're planning to do, Panorama, the new data tool that we have, for um, students that are receiving intervention supports or intervention plans, there is a method by which we can share those intervention plans and progress monitoring directly with parents via the platform. So that as that student's working, and that, that's an intervention in academics, SEL, absenteeism, whatever it is, it's not just academics. Um, the, student, the parents would be able to see both uh, either narrative or numeric updates on progress monitoring for those students to see how the students are responding to the intervention and supports and see the data associated with it in live time. So any day that they want to log in and take a look, it's there. Um, so I think those two things are a huge step in the right direction. Um, and then also our teachers and educators having more confidence in being able to understand the data that they're seeing and be able to share that with families as they're working with them um, was hopefully gonna be a big uh, effect of our work in literacy, but also uh, just having a more concrete and uh, fidelity-based plan uh, for local assessments. Uh, I'm feeling pretty hopeful about it. We've done a lot of listening sessions as well with families um, around a lot of things, including literacy, special education, but also report cards specifically. Um, and that was really interesting K through 12 to hear all these ideas about things that would make it more accessible and more useful to them. So we're continuing to explore those things as well, but I think we'll see, this is a, a big goal for us, um, to make that data useful for everybody and accessible, but also sustainable. Um, that's why we're, we're all kind of quietly geeking out about Panorama because it takes a lot of the sustainability um, and puts it into play for us. You don't have to quietly geek it. Uh, I'm a big <laughs> fan of, of data in all forms. Yeah. And, and transparency. Thank you very much. Yep. I have a quick follow-up to that, and I have other questions too. But um, the follow -up, my follow-up was, um, <coughs> would you be able to speak directly to the public comment around like the star assessments and why that wouldn't be? So you're talking about sending a better report card. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak to why star assessments might not be shared pub you know, widely with families and caregivers? Well, I think the initial response to that was that we didn't want Renaissance Star to become 
perceived as high stakes testing by students. Um, and that was advised to us as we were onboarding with Renaissance Star um, way back when, now five years ago. Um, but that was the initial response. I think what's difficult about, difficult about the Renstar data, that as we're presenting it here, we're presenting proficiency levels. So one of the challenges is we could have a student, so let's say we have a third grader that's working at a second grade level, but progressing at a second grade level, showing a full year's worth of growth at a second grade level. They will still show as below on the proficiency score. Does that make sense? So, so it's missing some contextual information about progress for students that's not really telling the story, or lack of progress. Where are the areas that we're not progressing? And so those proficiency levels don't necessarily tell the story of what we're doing or should be doing at a deeper level. That's why we're excited about those diagnostic levels, because those will give more specific information about a student. When we do a Renaissance star assessment, it gives a student an ex a expected grade level equivalent for reading. But the program doesn't listen to a student read. It doesn't hear them read. It projects based on an algorithm where the student might be in terms of their grade level equivalent. The only way we can get a proper fluency diagnostic on a student is to do a running record and understand how they read out loud, what their fluency and accuracy is, and their comprehension. The screener just does kind of a once over to say, okay, we think this is where the student probably will land based on these factors. And admittedly, we did not have a, a good layer of diagnostic information below that. And that's why we're focusing in on that to provide more meaningful information that's specific to where a student is based on those diagnostic assessments. And how many, like what percentage of students roughly are doing like the other diagnostic assessments versus like the STAR assessment? Right now, it's, it was pretty much the students receiving um, intervention support or special education services. But we hope to do everybody doing those diagnostics, at least the first layer of diagnostics, the fluency assessment and the spelling diagnostic. Okay. I'm just trying to be clear. So like, it feels like maybe um, what, you're, what you just said about some of the reasons why STAR assessments would not be sent home was mostly pertaining to students who are receiving special ed services because of the variety of other assessments that are being done and that they might conflict with. No, I can only share my opinion. It was an administrative discussion, so it wasn't just a mic thing. Um, not sending home the Renaissance Star, my opinion is that it could send the message to students that this is a high stakes test and we really need them not to think that, particularly in our middle school and elementary school. Um, because we want to see them in their natural environment when they take that assessment to be able to, to give us things. It was recommended to us by Renaissance Star to not do that at the time that we onboarded. That was, that was kind of my stance on it. And then as an administrative team, we discussed it, what, last week? And uh, unanimously, it was the same opinion. But I'm going to wait. It's we can rotate through. Okay. Okay. Um, I have questions. Rotation. Yeah. Um, so we, uh, I appreciate you including the um, the s continuous improvement plan goals. I'm curious to know from you know what you think it will take to get to hit. The, can we hit the goal by this point next year of having a, having five percent of students in each? school receiving tier three supports and what will it take to get there i i think i'm very optimistic about it okay um it is a it is a challenging number to get to um i'm optimistic because of our focus on tier one and two uh to getting that number in tier three is not about improving tier three necessarily it's about improving tier one and two and i think we're going to have more tools to do that next year particularly in literacy and mathematics um, in a way that is thoughtful, engaged the educators, everyone's kind of aware where we are, where we're starting in the fall. We're, we're at a really good launching space for the first time in several years to do this kind of curricular shift. So I'm feeling very optimistic about it. Um, 
the, the, I would say the same about the chronic absenteeism goal. Um, that is an ambitious number for us at, the, at this rate, but also feel like we are in, I don't want to speak for Nick, but feel like we're in great space. We've been doing the right work. We're focused in the right areas. We've got our plan for the fall. Feel like we're, we're doing what we can to reach those numbers. I had a follow-up question to that. Um, I think <clears throat> specifically the RVS numbers were somewhat glaring at 52%, which is 25 out of 50 if we're working at a at those numbers, so half of our students are needing tier three supports. Um, if that's the case, does your kind of prescription for getting there tier one to tier two, is that adequate for RVS or is there going to be additional strategies needed there? Um, and I don't know if you're ready to speak at the granule level and kind of a school building specific, but I think for my community, I think if folks are looking at those numbers, that, that does feel pretty glaring. So I'm curious if you think that's going to be sufficient at an RBS. Okay. Actually, yeah, the RBS educators have been as involved as the UES educators mm -hmm. in all the curricular work mm -hmm. uh, towards the end of the year here. We've worked with the reporting measures. Um, we've got the articulated curriculum. We've got the diagnostic assessments. We've got a plan to roll out those trainings. RBS educators will participate in letters training along with UES teachers next year. Mm -hmm. So I feel like we've got all the right ingredients to support that out there, mm -hmm. um, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Thanks. <laughs> Ping pong. Uh, <laughs> um, I would love to know from each of you, um, as as you all know, I think the board is going. Our retreat is in about a month, and we are focused during that time period on um, within the three priority areas the board has identified based on the um, visioning work that we that we did with the community we're going to be setting indicators of success so and we are definitely looking to you all as the educational experts we would love to know from you what does success look like we're looking at what our current status is right now with the report you've provided for us which is greatly appreciated and it's a little hard to know is that good are are we where we ought to be and in about a month we as a board are going to be saying kind of kind of setting that in maybe not stone but pretty well on paper um, and it, that will be the benchmark that we're aiming for and that we look at when we have these presentations a few times a year and it'll be so it's I, we need to I think we need a little bit more information from you on what does success look like so that when we have these conversations we know whether or not we're we're getting there so I'd love to know from each of the four of you within your expertise areas what does success look like I'll start. I, I think um, <laughs> I think success um, for academics should take a look at progress, um, and I'm not sure of how to do that with the metrics. Uh, that's that's we're learning that we're focusing in on. How do we how do we extract progress or lack of progress from students to be able to report out on that information? Um, you know, Libby and I were looking at some of the the data that we had, and we saw evidence of some very great growth in students at UES, for example. And, um, but we need to get to a layer where we can see within that progress who are the students that aren't progressing and why and understand that zone. And also, if students are progressing, what is it that we have done that has impacted that progress and that, or that rate of progress, the total progress? We need to understand progress more um, than focusing on uh, proficiency benchmarks from year from term to term. Can I can I just jump in and kind of ask her? I, I I totally understand that, but I mean I can see two situations: one where you have someone who's progressing but constantly progressing behind where they should be at. Yep. And how do you address that? And then what about the students that have that are far along in the progression scale and are kind of running out of room to progress without being pushed. We should see that too. Yeah, that's that reteach and enrich yeah. component that we really need to get in there. And we don't necessarily, again, get that data from proficiency because yeah. those kids always just get a three and four. And we're like, oh, there's, there's our threes and fours. So it's that, I agree with you, it's that how do we, how do we get to that layer of 
being able to analyze progress or lack of progress um, and, and normal progress. What, is, what should be expected at that average range of, of progress and how does that apply to, to the different ends? Yeah, I agree. I would say from, <clears throat> from my domain, you will not be surprised to hear that it is the absenteeism rate is the monitor of, of what we define as success. And the reason that I would push that is that absenteeism is an indicator of student wellness, engaging academics, family wellness, uh, and students feeling connected to the building, right? So when you look at absenteeism numbers, you are really looking at academics, you're looking at social emotional wellness, you're looking at community wellness. Young people are not um, able to, to access their academics if they're not in the building. Uh, they're not gonna have feelings of belonging, connectedness if they're not in the building. And oftentimes when young people are not in the building, um, there may be something happening with the family as well where they're not feeling uh, a level of connectedness and well-being connected to education. So I think uh, absenteeism is a, is a really strong indicator of kind of all of the above. Um, thinking about special education students with IEPs, certainly um, growth and rate of progress are two things that we need to try to figure out um, how to look at as a system. Um, compared to other places, so I did try to look up some data to see um, nationally, the um, U.S. Department of Education, the last year that they have data from is 21-22, and um, the national average was 15% of students had IEP, so we are lower than that, we're about 11%. In Vermont, that same school year, the rate was 18%, um, so that is just interesting information to think about, um, but I do think that um, trying to figure out how we can system systemically look at how students are growing. Um, you know, like we, we had students exit special education this year, so those students obviously have closed that gap, but how do we, um, you know, kind of make sure that that's happening, that all students are progressing and being able to report that out. And that's something that we're still trying to figure out a way to um, do without me sitting there, you know, doing it all by hand. Um, so s excited to see if Panorama will be able to provide us some of that opportunity. One of the things that is really glaring whenever I do these data presentations um, is in the SEL world right now, our landscape is measuring SEL progress based on like how many kids have incidents, right? So it's really looking at um, sort of like the negatives mm -hmm. rather than having a really good way to measure the actual SEL skill and all of the wonderful things and the ways that kids are being resilient um, and growing and learning how to communicate and learning how to adapt to hard situations. Um, so my hope is that in the future, um, Panorama really gives us a tool to measure those um, and we'll have um, universal screeners around belonging climate that we can leverage to make more informed decisions rather than just our progress being based on our behavioral incidents are going down, our suspensions are going down. Um, those are all good things and things that we want to see, and it doesn't really shed light on all of the great things that kids are doing and all of the really strong work that our educators are doing to support students in the SEL world. I see Scott, I think, has his name. Oh, Scott. Awesome, thank you. Um, so, Peggy, so you mentioned that we're, we're like 11%. Um, with uh, students with IEPs, I think you just said the the state average is more like eighteen, um, and and that I'm assuming that's the current number, which is like twenty percent higher than it was just a year and a half ago. And so, I, how do how do we interpret that increase in I is, like is that good? Does that mean like those students weren't accessing the services and now they are? Um, yeah. So I, just that 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 increase of 20% of, of the students, 20% more students on IEPs. Um, how, do, how do we interpret that? 20% in the district? Are you talking yeah, about you, you, we for went the last from, eight years? 
Yeah, I think in what you presented November 2022 was like, I can't remember what you said, 119. And now it's up to 145 or something like that. Oh, okay. Um, so 2015, it was 119. And, um, and then this year, we're up to 139. Um, I don't necessarily know I was here. So, um, you know, I just have the reports. Um, you know, as far as, uh, you know, what was happening at that time. Part of what I did look at um, is comparing, like, the disability categories that we have in our district compared to the national um, averages that were, or information that was available. And again, this is the 21-22 school year. So um, nationally, um, but our rate for um, students with specific learning disability um, is about the same as the national average. One of the things that was a big difference, but I think it's also a difference um, in Vermont in general, and I, it's an anecdotal thing I've just heard over the years, is that nationally only 5% of students uh, qualify under emotional disturbance. And currently in our district, we are uh, about 15%. Um, and I've always heard that Vermont has more students that qualify under emotional disturbance. I've never really heard why, um, but it's just something that s special education directors talk about all the time. Um, so I don't, I don't have a really, I wish I could tell you more. Um, I do, I think it will be interesting to see uh, what happens with our numbers of students with IEPs with the regulation changes because now we'll be looking at the functional skills and SEL skills as a basic skill area, which requires us to um, do figure out how to progress monitor and measure that. Um, and so uh, it, it will be interesting to see in the next year even what, what that looks like um, for students because I think we have a number of students um, with Section 504 plans that potentially we could be looking at um, needing more intensive um, and st specialized instruction around those skills. So, um, but I don't, sorry, I don't have good interpretation because I don't, I don't know. Emma? Uh, so I want to rewind a little bit and just give like a moment of praise for the four of you sitting here and two of you sitting back there, but there's three of you up there that are brand new this year, and two of you have brand new positions as of this year. Is that right? These are new positions that didn't exist last year. Uh, Nick and yes. Jess. Oh, Jess has been here for two. No, 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 I just Nick is in the budget. fade in and out. Oh, okay. <laughs> Nick was a new position last year. Yeah. So very new work that's being done for the district and two really awesome new principals that are sitting behind you and even Mike isn't new, but you were asked to do a million other things during the pandemic. And so really you weren't able to like do the work of a curriculum director the way that you have been able to in the past year or year and a half or so. So I think it's really incredible the amount of progress that's been made just on my tenure on the board, watching the work that you all have done. Um, so I really appreciate all of that. And it's definitely reflected in this level of data presentation that we didn't really used to have. Um, so I, I really appreciate it, thank you. Um, and another, uh, another question that I had was for Nick. I was wondering if you have any data around how our absentee rates compare to some of our neighboring districts. Yeah, it's uh, hard to say when compared to neighboring districts. So Vermont is one of the few states that does not have chronic absenteeism as a part of its um, like ESSA plan. Uh, so there's 35 states that have it as part of their plan, and those states do really well about reporting absenteeism, things like that. I have a strong feeling if I would go to some of our neighboring districts and ask for their chronic absenteeism rate, um, it's not something that would be at the top of their list. Uh, it's not something, and, and again, I, I haven't had these, I, I've, I've communicated with a lot of our, our partnering districts around a lot of things, but when I bring up chronic absenteeism, standalone, I don't tend to get a lot of traction. Um, so it is hard to say uh, compared to our local districts where we would stand mm -hmm. from a purely chronic absenteeism percentage. What I would say is student engagement, absenteeism uh, in our, our neighboring districts when I'm on 
um, calls with like Agency of Education, we have other folks there. It's with the crew that I'm talking to, the number one thing is like these students are not coming into the building. Um, it's so hard to, to turn uh, these young people that have really disengaged to a point that the re-engagement for those tier three students is so tough. And there's a struggle of like, do we go the court route? Do we go the restorative route? Do we go uh, the route that is maybe more challenging, which is like just build capacity around meeting with those students and families to case manage almost outside of the school? Um, that is a topic that um, is rising to the top across most of the districts around us and throughout the state. Did you have a chance to compare our data with any of those other states that actually do look at it? Yes. Um, so when we look at 2023, uh, so states, there's only three states that uh, produce chronic absenteeism numbers, like live. So uh, those three states have numbers, like through June, maybe today, that we could look on their state report cards and see their numbers. Um, it's like Connecticut, Rhode Island, and I think there's one other one. I think Massachusetts. Um, and th their numbers may be in the 20 to 30 percent range. Um, but the interesting thing that we've seen this year happen is that when we look at 21-22 data to 22-23 data, they're very similar. Mm -hmm. So in Connecticut, I think it was 23 percent, 21-22. And this year, it's 22.5% for the state. So again, when I was saying earlier, where we aren't seeing that big reduction, that we were all kind of like, man, I hope, I hope we see this return now that quarantines aren't as big of a thing. From the data that's been released this year so far, it's not something we've seen. So you have been nerding out on the data? I have. <laughs> oh, he doesn't. Not quietly. <laughs> is there any data on what the most effective things a school district can do yeah, for chronic right. absenteeism? Because there's yes. so many factors that obviously go into chronic absenteeism. Yeah. A lot of them are very hard for the school to address. Yeah, so there's, there's a large number of things. And as a state, like we have truancy laws, right, that we have to follow and we have to report to state's attorney and we have to go to DCF. Um, one of the big parts of research will say truancy isn't that effective. Uh, when we talk about sending families through the court system because they're not coming to school, you don't see much return on investment there. You don't see many gains there. Um, you see gains in compliance, which doesn't translate to school engagement, connectedness, anything like that, which is really what's gonna move the needle. So the research would say it's about positive engagement, it's about early engagement, it's about um, Jason and Julie and I, uh, going out this summer and doing home visits with our students and families that were chronically absent this year to say, we can't wait to see you next year, how can we help? Right? It's not to say, you're not in school, we need to fix you. It's to say, like, my name's Nick, here's my number, call me if you need anything, we're going to be in touch this year. It's really about building capacity to build connectedness with our families. Um, so there's a lot of research out there. It is not about truancy. Uh, that's shown time and again. It is about positive engagement, family connectedness, student connectedness. And despite the numbers, Nick has <laughs> has had some serious successes with with families who last year would not step on our parking lot, let alone in our buildings, to, to kids coming to school every day. So Nick has Nick has done a marvelous job, and picks up kids regularly in the morning to get them here. <laughs> Still work. Yeah. Just a quick follow-up. Do any do you know of any other neighboring districts or in Vermont who have a position like yours? Do you, uh, have, do you have colleagues in other districts? Not as explicit as my role, but like I was like Barry uh, had reached out to get the position description because they want to introduce this kind of role in Barry. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we've heard that from a few other districts, um, and there are some districts that definitely have a person that's been kind of doing this work. Um, maybe not with the explicitness of like, you know, I always say like I spend more time in living rooms than classrooms, mm -hmm. and that's something that I would push for more to see more of, mm -hmm. out of folks that are that are doing this kind of role. Yeah, I think Harwood does. I just had a follow up comment. Um, just to get about you know, yes, there are 
there, there are many factors that contribute to why you know students go to school, but I also wonder if this would be interesting data for our state legislators to see, um, because this is clearly connected to affordable housing, it's connected to emergency shelter, so you know this would be great information for us to collect as a state, and anything that we can do to advocate that or bring that up you know, with legislators um, feels like it could be really important, because it, it's having ramifications that legislators probably can't see. It's not a, a clear direct line, but right, like yeah. these factors in our state are, are clearly affecting our kids' ability to go to school, which could actually impact their ability to be successful in their life. And that is no small thing. Um, so it would be great if the state as a whole would collect that information, and like uh, many other, like the majority of the states yeah. in our country are, are doing. And, so I'm curious, like, what agency that sits with, you know, is it something that we would advocate for the agency of education to collect or something so that it could have this kind of bigger impact in decision making? Yeah, I have lots of thoughts. <laughs> I will keep it short and say, you can Google right now chronic absenteeism Vermont and it will take you to a dashboard from mm -hmm. AOE that has data from 2021, which is the year that anybody that took attendance in 2021, I, I don't know what that was, how it was defined, if people took attendance. So if you look at that dashboard from the Agency of Education, the Chronic Absenteeism Dashboard, you will see that Vermont is crushing it. They are at 2%. You will see that there was two kids at Montpelier High School that were chronically absent. It's, it's a data issue, I would say, and I've said this to folks of the state. You could also call the Agency of Education, which has a lot of really good people doing really good work. And, and I've asked, like, who is my point person to talk to about attendance? Yeah. And I will get three or four different names, and they're like, well, we don't really... Uh, the last thing I'll say is um, there's an organization called Attendance Works. Uh, it's a national organization that does chronic absenteeism work. And they just released a state policy scan where they kind of outline every state website, uh, uh, report card, chronic absenteeism, how they do it, if they do it. Uh, Vermont is one of, I think, six states that doesn't have data as of 21-22 school year. So Vermont is like one of six when it comes to chronic absenteeism that their data that they've published online is so outdated. Um, so I, I just think it's not front and center here. Again, it's not part of like our, the state plan with, with the, the Department of Education, and so it's not centered. Mm -hmm. And I think it should be, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I have a question for Peggy Sue. So um, I think I understood that you were reporting that 23% of people who, I don't under, really understand the data, but 23% received of kids in the data set uh, received no evaluation. Mm -hmm. And I know you spoke to that quickly, but I just wasn't totally sure if you, maybe you could give me some education on what some of the general reasons why um, an evaluation might not be done. Sure, so um, some parents or families may um, ask for it and then when we have a conversation and talk about what it is, they may say, oh, that's actually not what I'm looking for or not what my kid needs. Um, we have some families that the school has reached out and the families don't want to do the evaluation. Um, sometimes teams get together and look at student data and they don't see any evidence that would show um, a suspected disability or that there is um, any concern about um, academics and so then that they may make the decision not to do it. Let's say those are the three big ones. Um, and in uh, case, a lot of cases, not a lot of cases, in some cases, um, once parents understand the difference between special education and Section 504, they say, oh, actually, Section 504 is what um, you know, I want to look at. And so then an evaluation happens through Section 504 instead of special education. And would there be, would there be a case, I mean, where a family or caregivers um, wanted an evaluation done but then could not have that done, like were refused that? Would it be like a time management thing, like we're not seeing the evidence of a need to evaluate, so therefore you're falling to the sort of the bottom of the priority list? Uh, it wouldn't be around time management or priority list. If we, um, if a team gets together and there's no evidence to support the need for an evaluation, then we may not do an evaluation, but um, we, it wouldn't, we can't say like we're not going to do it now because we don't have time, so we'll do it later. Like we, that, that, we're not allowed to do that. 
So, but yes, there could be situations where parents uh, ask for something and when we look, when we get together and we look at the, all of the data, there's nothing to support needing to do an evaluation. That's pretty rare, but yeah. And would there be a mechanism in that rare situation for families to say, well, we're seeing something at home maybe that you're not catching in and like push for it? Or would they have to then go to an outside organization? Um, so if um, in, in a situation like that, uh, the family gets a, it's called a prior written notice. So it's an LEA decision. And if they disagreed with it, then there are different way mechanisms that they could go to to try to change that decision. Yeah. Um, I had another quick question for you is uh, just about the position, the empty positions. Are they filled for next year? Two of them are. We still need what we need a person at the high school still. Okay. So if anyone knows any special educator that for some reason doesn't have a job in June, um, maybe moving in out of state or something like that, uh, you know, we're really hopeful to still try to find somebody this summer. Um, I also wanted to echo what Emma's gratitude and also broadcast it out beyond the people in this room because I know that it's taken teams and teams and teams of our educators and our staff to, to, to have a, a, an academic year like this one and to be able to produce the um, report that we're seeing today. So I um, also wanted to um, make sure to acknowledge that. So thank you for that. And I have some follow-up questions on the literacy um, data. Um, first is a little bit of a clarifying question for you, Mike. I just want to make sure I'm reading. The FNP proficiency score, that's essentially using the same scale that we would see on a report card, right? Yes. Okay. So um, that's helpful for me because when we shifted from, like, it was, like, percentage of... <laughs> I think it was the Ren Star was like percentage of certain schools or grades yep. are at proficiency. Going from percentage numbers to decimal points was throwing me off a little. So the clarification is helpful. And then when it says that our third graders are at 2.64, that means that our third graders are ending the year as a, as a whole, not yet reading at grade level. Is that essentially what we would? The data here would show that the students that took the assessment, uh -huh. of the students that took the assessment, that that's the, that's the, the average of right. all those students. Why would, they not meet, why would they not take the assessment? In some cases this past year when students were already achieving or above, they were not reassessed in the winter uh -huh. to avoid over-assessing students. Okay. So that would maybe tell us that we do have, there, are, there would be students that if they didn't take the assessment because they're, oh, okay, achieving that's a proficiency. Part of, that's a part that's of my whole, proficiency doesn't tell the whole story okay. component. Yeah. Um, because we, we removed the students that would contribute threes and fours, potentially, in, right. the, in that element. Um, but that is something that specifically that we are going to address next year with consistent assessment. Okay throughout right. for students. Um, the, the challenge with the FNP is it takes a really long time to administer. Uh -huh. And so when we were looking at those diagnostics and literacy, where we were looking for things that gave us the same or better information, but potentially more efficiently, so that we could assess students across, um, consistently across the year uh -huh. without a teacher not being able to instruct for a week while we're assessing, or students having to take 30 to 35 minutes assessments three times a year. Um, so we're feeling really confident about our plan for next year, being able to do that in a manageable way for teachers, students, families, the whole. Got it. The whole show. Okay. So then, then what we're looking forward to next year, like at this time next year, would be a number that tells a more complete story of, yes. say, where our third graders are, our fourth graders are, our eighth graders are at. Correct. Got it. Okay. Yep. Is that just, is that for one type of assessment or all of the assessments? I'm not sure what you mean. So like Star, Ren Star, Fountas and Pinnell, are you planning to give the, all of those assessments to all kids or are so we that, just talking about Star? So the, the last slide shows that broad to specific. That second layer, we want students to have the universal screeners and state assessments. And then we want them to have common diagnostics, is the box that's on that last slide. Uh, decoding, fluency, automaticity, comprehension, and fluency expression. We want all that data on all students. 
And, the, and that data is collected by which assessments? A uh, running record and a spelling diagnostic. So not RENSTAR and not Fontes and Pinnell? Uh, RENSTAR would be at that layer Down. above. Okay, sorry. Fontes and Pinnell does, so. and Pinnell does so include a running record. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I had a question too around the, just it, it seemed like it was a very low rate of, um, of participation in the STAR testing. And so I didn't really understand that. I think I'm understanding it better now. I, a follow-up question on that is um, Main Street Middle School for the reading, the STAR reading, all three rows for that data are exactly the same. And I'm just wondering if that is accurate. And then also why Main Street Middle School is such an outlier of having only 3% of students not tested when other schools range from like 30 to 54% of students not tested? It's a great question. Part of it is because Julie Conrad's awesome. Um, that's a big part of it. Um, no, uh, so one of the things that Main Street has in play for consistent assessment is they, they just have a good system for doing it. Um, they make sure it happens. They have strong oversight. That's not to say that the other schools don't, because I'll, I'll share what impacts their assessments. But this is also very exciting that their data stayed the same, because it means that the students were achieving uh, a year's worth of growth at, a, at an average rate, um, which is, is actually great. Um, that's a really good thing. At UES, there are two different RENSTAR assessments that are administered. One is the early literacy assessment that's generally given to K and 1 students, so roughly 20, well, was it? Yeah, 40% of the school takes that assessment, not the reading assessment. And the way Ren Star works is that they show as not having assessed in the reading assessment, even though they took the other reading assessment. So that's one of the things there. There's also a discrepancy. These scores came from the consolidated uh, report within Renaissance Star which takes a lot of uh, general data and gives you a summary. One of those things is that if a student in the fall takes the assessment but then moves out, it just shows that that student didn't take the assessment in the winter, didn't take the assessment in the spring. It doesn't show that they moved out. So that's one of the challenges with this mm -hmm. consolidated report. At the high school, as I mentioned, we have some engagement challenges with students taking the assessment. Um, and we put in a full court press on getting those makeups and, and sometimes they just don't happen. Or we have students take the assessment, the whole assessment, in six minutes or less. Mm -hmm. And so that's also not contributing to excellent data um, at the high school. But Jason and I have got it handled. We're going to fix that up. So I think you kind of touched on a, a little follow-up question I had. Sorry. Yep. People are wondering with questions. But that in that MSMS Reading Star assessment, that stays the same. There's a growth average scale score reported of 0.8. Can you speak to that? So like the yes. percentage is staying the same, but the scale score is 8. 8. Yeah. 0. 0.0. So <laughs> we put this in here because this is our attempt to really start to understand growth perspective. I did tell a story. I'm not just saying this because Julie's here, but um, Julie dug into some of the, the scale score growth and the growth measurements within Renaissance Star and we found students that were probably below proficient according to proficiency that showed significant growth in their skills by looking at things like the scaled score growth. So what this column shows is the average increase of scaled score across students from winter to spring according to Renaissance Star. So irregardless of proficiency the average student went up eight points in their scaled score of their, their assessment. And you can see at RBS they went up 32, um, at UES 3, and at the high school 1. So it's a little hard to understand for someone who's not as data oriented as you and I think Scott seems to be. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but so like if at or above if seventy if it stays consistent seventy three, but there can you just kind of like give me a little story an anecdotal story of a kid who would stay consistent with their, yeah. but then like have all this growth and proficiency. So in the in the fall, the scaled score range to get at or above proficiency is here. Mm -hmm. In the winter, it moves here. Yeah. Okay. A student can still progress 
and miss that window, but show some pretty serious progress. And then the scale, the, the scale score range in the spring moves again to get above or, or at or above proficient. Because grade level is now closer to the next grade that they're about to go into. So they're moving through the proficiencies yeah. at grade level. Essentially, yeah. But scaled scores give, uh, scaled scores give like a total points for a student. Mm -hmm. And then the proficiencies are based on ranges of scaled scores, but those scale, those ranges move uh, fall, winter, and spring. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it goes again back to why that, that proficiency sometimes doesn't tell the whole story. Particularly for students, we do have students that are working below grade level, mm -hmm. but showing significant progress, but their proficiency is still going to show that they're below mm -hmm. every time. Mm -hmm. So Emma, did, did you ever pay attention to the SBAC page sheets that were sent home for your kiddos? Yeah. And you could see, like, the graph on there showed scaled scores really nicely. Like, if I think of my daughter, right, she just barely made it into the three. Like, she was in a three proficiency, so she was at grade level, but she, like, made it by, like, ten points to, uh, right. on the scaled score, right? right? Um, so what, what could happen to show that growth is a kid barely made it into the at or above proficiency, right, with their scaled score, but then when the scaled score moves, their scaled score grew quite a bit. You know, like that's how you show the range of proficient is, up, is yeah. multiple. Right. They could, have, they could have gone from the beginning of a scaled score grouping mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to the end of a scaled score grouping, yeah, yeah. and they'd still be in the proficient range, but that's more growth than one you know, time period that they're yeah. expecting. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's helpful. I wonder if there's a way to, um, you know, to show that more visually, like the how you're talking about mm -hmm. that that feels more important to you and your team to show growth than... Or lack of growth. Or lack of growth. Um, that if there might be like a better way to sort of like showcase that. Yep. And you're saying that might come through this new software. Well, I'm saying that that's a big focus for us. That's, that's mm -hmm. where we want to shift the data focus is mm -hmm. to be able to understand that growth more or lack of growth. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because Mike's example of this, the third grader is reading at a second grade level. Like, we, we don't need to make one year of growth with that kiddo. We need to make a year and a half of growth mm -hmm. or two years growth with that kid in one year, right? So we have to, like, that's something to really pay attention to. It also translates to the report card. We want to figure out a way to make report cards meaningful for students that are working out of level instead of NA and ones and twos every time. Mm -hmm. That report card is useless for students like that, students and families. We want to be able to report out on the students' actual progress on the goals and skills that they are working on versus what we're doing now, which is reporting the proficiency at grade level. It seems related to what Jess was talking about around like the deficiency model you know, of behavioral reporting and that perhaps it might be interesting to look at, you know, positive growth all, as well. One more. <laughs> Sorry, this is data demystified. This is really, really helpful. I am enjoying this. Um, just in terms of like the diagnostics, so are those tools that are going to be primarily used like internally to inform instructional practice and intervention, or are those like diagnostics that families will see results from that might come up in you know conferences, or is most of how student progress is going to be communicated to families through the report cards and ideally with like these additions of like, you know, showing growth. I'm just curious about the diagnostics and then like, are we creating them in house to respond specifically to like our priority standards and our priority or and our curriculum? Or are those things we like get from like an external organization? Like, Cause uh, I heard you say like, we might be another year out for math, I think. Yeah, math will take us a, a little bit, but not much. Uh, yeah. Just one of the math assessments that I mentioned was the OGAP. It's, it's got a, a weird name, Ongoing Assessment Project or something like that. Um, but that requires some serious training mm -hmm. to be able to do it. It's going to take us some time to, mm -hmm. to be able to implement. And so Julie and I have been talking about that at the middle school and have a plan to start training uh, a few folks to build our capacity and be able to hopefully pilot by the spring at least one element of that assessment, but it's, a, it, it's kind of a big deal. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and the PNOA at the, the elementary level is a little easier to reach for us. We have access to that already. We just need to look at how it aligns with our instructional components. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's well within reach. I think to answer your question about the literacy, what was challenging before, we were kind of, it could be a cart and horse analogy, but um, now that we have our prioritized standards, our proficiency scales, our scope and sequence for literacy instruction, it makes so much more sense to be able to align the diagnostics to that. When we were trying to di get diagnostics and not have that, there was this kind of disconformity of what are we, what are we doing? Like what, so I gave this assessment, now what do I do? How does it inform my instruction? Now we've got that, that loop set up so that it would make sense. Um, we already have access to all of these tools. So that's great. We're not going out and trying to create these things mm -hmm. or, or to find them somewhere. We're already doing that. We did a small pilot of this stuff um, this spring with fourth graders at UES and RBS to inform fifth grade for next year. And then Julie and I and a crew of people also did this work with uh, five through eight, which actually gives us eighth grade to ninth grade as well. So we, and, it, and we learned a whole lot about the assessments and how to build them into our systems so that they can inform instruction mm -hmm. and inform communication with families. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so I, I, there's some particulars to still work out, you know, without sounding dramatic, but it was down to the final minute of doing this work this year. So there's some summer things and then there's some rollout in the fall with educators on, on how we're gonna use this more consistently. Mm -hmm. um, everyone's aware of the plan, they know what it is, Ne next year will be the, hey, this is how we're gonna do it. This is what it looks like day to day. And some practice on packing that. Like, I'm, Julie, Julie's a math person. I'm an elementary person. We did the middle school data, and we were both geeking out like little children, <laughs> excited about what we knew about kids mm -hmm. from these assessments. And so we're excited to do that with educators, with live data, with students that are in their classrooms, that they can, act on that right away very cool yeah yeah this is just a really helpful behind the scenes and like clearly this work does not happen at the snap of a fingers or a waving of a wand there's a lot of build out to do and so i'm just appreciating the commitment and the diligence around it and then being able to communicate it to us so thank you so i just want to be mindful of time we're half hour over i'm sure these folks are excited to go see their families let's maybe take a couple more questions and and because we're going to have this is a continuing discussion so emma and then yeah, yeah. The the, and then the if anybody ET else cap results <coughs> you said um maybe sometimes in august i know that there's a lot of people in this community that are maybe having a little trauma response around that because of the embargoed da other data and how long it's been taking for the community to see numbers um do we have any fear that this will be embargoed as well or that we actually are going to get it okay, you guys, this is good as <coughs> okay. It, you know, all sarcasm aside um, yeah you'll probably know at the exact moment that we do um i i don't know okay i would hope not yeah we did everything that we were supposed to do in the multiple updates of the manual on how to do it. So hopefully it's there. Um, you know, and, and having said that, that's why I'm hedging a little bit about, I, I don't know what format the data comes in. Mm -hmm. Do we get a big spreadsheet? Is there a dashboard? You know. And they've already said ninth grade won't be there in August because right. the ninth grade test was so messed up. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's, it's hard to say what we're gonna see and be able to glean from it. I think my big question is what, what's the depth of the data? How, how far can I dig into the results? Um, you know, at least with, with SBAC, we were able to see different layers of reading skills and writing skills, and, and we could parse it out a couple different ways. I don't know the structure of the VTCAP. The kids also had a much different testing environment for SBAC than they did for VCAP. I mean, these guys can, can tell you that you know, pointing to Julie and Jason in the back that like our sixth graders, some of our sixth graders were in tears for frustration because they kept getting kicked out of the test and we had to just stop it automatically. I mean, it's, yep. and that, and we're not alone with that. Like the, the entire state experienced similar responses. My ninth grader came home and <laughs> said, Ma, I've never seen half the things that was on that math test. They've never taught it to me. Like I've literally never seen it. Did you know that graphs could curve? <laughs> you know, like he'd say things like that to me, you know. 
So there are so many problems with this rollout with the with the test that. Uh, okay. So manage expectations. Yeah. And then be hopeful. Cross fingers. Mm -hmm. Okay. We did get better at it. MSM has worked out most of our kinks. But mm -hmm. MHS had less kinks, and I think UES had the fewest out of all of them. Thank thank heavens for the little guys. Um, Go ahead, John. Okay, real quick, if you run out of data to um, review, <laughs> um, a lot of Montpelier Roxbury kids are part of that longitudinal adolescent brain <laughs> development study that UVM oh, was one of the sites, yeah. and they have a 97% retention rate. So, like the kids that are, I mean, and I can only speak because my kiddo is one of them, um, that are like, you know, freshman, sophomore now started when they were like 10. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if, if you folks were aware that that's like going on. So, mm -hmm. it basically was a national study. There's 11,000 students in this pretty extensive brain development study and it started like I said several years ago and then a pandemic came along too and they were able to continue that study so they do MRIs every other year they did a t do a ton of student surveys and a ton of parents surveys and they're releasing data each year as they go so there's just some really interesting stuff in there for the sort of bigger picture because I have to say what I'm leaving with tonight frankly Nick is the 78 percent that my heart still hurts after hearing that like I that as a community we need to be doing more and I, I appreciated Jim's question of like is there is there something the district could provide that could support those families better a lot of us drive our kids to school every day we've got room in our cars I know that's a lot easier said than done but like what would another one of you or I know we're going to talk about our budget and like the transportation is a major factor so I I think there are a lot of things w that we're all bumping up against that are out of our control, but also can really inform that support. And I'm rambling, but I wanted to mention that study because I do think a lot of it is provides even sort of additional state and national context for like what our kids have been going through over the last eight years. My kids yeah. in that too, it's really interesting. And I w I'll also remind the board that um, you all voted in the budget to get Nick to AmeriCorps members for next year to, to help his work as well. So I can't imagine a better mentor than Nick and team to mentor AmeriCorps people. So they will, I'm assuming they're joining us. It's all in uh, your, your belly whip. The program but. ended from no way. Uh, Washington County Youth Service Bureau ran a uh, youth development core uh, for 30 years. And we finished our application, we submitted it, and uh, they recently decided they are not going to run programs moving forward. Oh, so there will not. not be two AmeriCorps members that stinks. joining. So never mind. Maybe, well, we have the money. We have the money. So Nick, we'll figure something out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nick, think how you can reallocate that then. Even if sure you thing. just get a, somebody to drive with that money. College yeah, we'll get there. Yeah. I wanted to switch gears back to um, the, some of the behavior data because it looks like there is a really a pretty big difference in the percentage of our between of our overall population um, with behavior incidents and a percentage of kids who are reported for behavior incidents who um, are in the economically disadvantaged demographic um, as well as kids on IEPs and I'm curious just anything that you have to say like what you make of that Jess yeah, I mean, I think it's a lot of similar as far as the economically disadvantaged, it's a lot of the similar stuff that Nick has spoken to. Um, I think that if they're in and out of school more, they have less of a chance to internalize a lot of the expectations. And so we tend to see mm -hmm. students who struggle with expectations if they're not in school. And there's a really big correlation, as we've seen, with economic disadvantaged um, students and chronic absenteeism. I think as far as students with IEPs, I think that's sort of twofold. Um, I think that sometimes um, we need to better understand how to shift our expectations, how to make them more accessible to a wider variety of students. And we also have students who are on IEPs because they have disabilities that make it really hard for them to behave in sort of typical ways. Um, mm -hmm. So that's something, data that I'm definitely looking at and thinking a lot about, especially in how we respond and use SEL skill building and CPS in our sort of practices rather than punitive discipline because we know that that's not going to make a difference for those students. Um, I'll also note that like students who identify as male also were significantly overrepresented in that data mm -hmm. as well. And then, a couple people who haven't I, really gone. Yeah. Well, I mean, like final if, question from. If we if reach our, 
If we reach our goal of no more than 5% of students needing tier three supports, how close is the board to the goal of closing the achievement gap, I guess? And what is that? It's a loaded question. <laughs> And then I'm not positive to the end. I, I don't, think that's we'd why be, it's sort of a question closer. for all of us. I mean, I think we'd be closer. I mean, the other, other thing that comes to mind is the cost, which I think the answer is there isn't a dollar amount. It's a matter of time and effort. The cost of the cost of human closing the of closing the achievement gap. Like, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Just the idea that, you know. Um, I that think it doesn't take time and effort and skill, skill building. Oh, it takes a lot of, yeah. That's what it takes. Yeah, it takes more of those So things, that's yeah. not really. Yeah, and button. quite honestly, the board has done a job over the past five years um, of adding human resources to intervention and peace. We had three when we started Yeah. Um, across the board, and that's including social emotional learning and academics. Um, Inter and interventionists, right? Interventionists, yeah. And we, we now have, quick yeah. math in my head, or? At least 10. Yeah. So over the past five years, there has been a cost to that, right? Um, and the board has gone with us on making sure that we have the human resources we need. And now we need to ensure that those human resources have the skills. Um, and we have the systems and the structures in the, to enable it. Uh, like the 5% number isn't pulled out of you know, Mike's left ear, it's, it's pulled from national research around RTI um, of what an appropriate percentage of students with high impact first instruction would need. Um, that's where that 5% came from. It's actually through research out of Florida, one of all places. That happened a bit, a bit ago. I don't know if there is research to say if you have a 5% rate around needing tier three if your opportunity gap is there. I'm not sure if that research exists or not. Mm -hmm. Be an interesting question for somebody's dissertation. Or. There you go, <laughs> I'll make it mine. Yeah, go for it, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> uh, anyone else? Oh, thank you so much. And I think, thank you. yeah, thank you I really appreciate it. And yeah, echo. Um, Emma and Nia's uh, you know, congratulations to your great work and you know really putting together a fantastic team and a lot of progress and you know again I've been on the board for a while and and the data just keeps getting better and and you know recently the the, the data is is really getting fantastic and I I appreciate your presenting it and I also appreciate your desire to to build it out more and and to to get even more compelling data so we can tell a, a more complete story because it really helps us understand where the district's at and where it's going. Thank you. Thank you. You're Thank free you. to go. <laughs>
Um, we also did do um, what, what Christina called two airtime buyouts, where we're, um, we paid out the rest of someone's um, retirement so that they could retire if they had less than a year of, of service left to be you know, fully vested. <coughs> so um, yeah, things to keep an eye on are continued vacancies, but also continued um, special education cost challenges. Um, the second page of the report is revenue. Um, and some of the pieces we wanted to make sure to mention, and again, the percentage received in that in that column is really only at the end of March. So in some of these cases, they, a lot of them say zero, but since this was created, they have probably been um, reimbursed to some expen extent. Um, one piece of concern was the Medicaid reimbursement. She noted that um, the revenue for that is going down, which does fund physicians, and because fewer families seem to be either eligible or reaching out. I don't know if you have more information on what that means, but <coughs> that was something she just wanted us to be aware of, that that revenue had gone down. And of course, now I'm going to have a coughing fit while I'm trying to talk to you all. <coughs> um, uh, on the bottom of the second page, sort of gives the snapshot of our reserve, our fund balance. Um, the unreserved set-asides, there's the, the final um, payment of that outside placement as the final $500 of that. We have the 50000 that the board has set aside for the potential net zero study. And then my understanding is that the RVS heat pumps, um, which is the, the final one that's $50,000, um, are going to be completed within, she said, by the end of this month, which is good news. Um, let's see. So we still do have a pretty significant amount in our fund balance um, so um, related to that, we had a dishwasher issue. <laughs> like um, as it broke? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't realize how quickly these dishwashers usually work. But um, long story short, um, there was about a $19,000 unanticipated expense because one of the dishwashers, I think at UES, UES. Um, broke. And so as always being resourceful, um, Jim and Christina and our team um, applied for a grant to split that cost with us, but we still want to make sure that we replace the dishwasher. So it raised the question that I think is a good one is sort of to think about as a board, do we want to work with Libby and Andrew and Christina to have like, okay, there's this like unexpected things like a, that every year there's probably something that comes up or breaks or gets broken. Um, and is the fund balance the, a place that we could pull from if we needed to for something like a dishwasher? We definitely don't want to get in the habit or the practice of like the board micromanaging every time something small breaks that the district clearly needs. Because this apparently, the newer ones or at least the ones at the middle school do 45 loads in an hour. Like they got to keep the dishes going. So this is not something you can like patch together or replace with people. <laughs> I can't <laughs> even imagine doing that. Yeah. So it's something for us to just sort of consider and think about is do we want to, and, um, and, and like we've talked about in the past as a board, we also have things that sort of come up like, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we X, Y, Z, and we've, we sort of have struggled with like, or not struggled with, but, but wrestled with, you know, having things either jump to the front of the line or are they nice to have versus need to have? And so maybe as a board, we sort of want to talk about like, and I think we have started to do that of like how we kind of make these decisions about when things come before us that are unexpected, you know, and how involved do we want or you want or need us to be in making those decisions too. I think a big question that, um, I'm sorry, wasn't at the finance committee. I was yeah. running around trying Had to- Had hundreds of people in the building that was without power. <laughs> trying yeah. to figure that we out. We only could hold it because there was still natural light in this room. So um, one of the questions that Grant and I both talked about when Grant was our business manager and Christine and I, it came up with the dishwasher scenario of is there a price point that the board wants us to come to you with of saying to get the approval out of the fund balance? Um, or is it everything? Is it, you know, like what, what's the dollar amount? You know, because I think it was like 23,000 or something for the dishwasher. And, um, and so I, I said to Christina, is there anywhere in policy that says the board needs to approve that type of purchase? And so we looked through policy and there isn't, it's not specific to any policy. So. I mean, or just have a standing practice, you yeah. know, if there's, if there's a number. I mean, it's more solidified if it's in policy because when I win the Powerball and leave, then the next yeah. superintendent will be, able to, <laughs> will be yeah. able to just know that. That's my Powerball. Um, but 
but it's also just a, I think it's just a good practice for us to. Yeah, know. well, and I can see different scenarios too. I can see, you know, like, if, if something comes up and it's not urgent and it's $25,000, I think that's something we'd want to probably maybe talk about. Talk about. Yeah. If the dishwasher breaks and we're going to have kids eating on dirty plates and it's $25,000. We would never have kids eating on dirty plates. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Or just, yeah. Huh? Whatever, but just make yeah, clear. where, <laughs> yeah, where it, ha where, where the, you know, there's a, an immediate an need. Yeah. Then I think we want to hear about it, but I don't think you need to wait till the next board right. meeting. Mm -hmm. Like, how do we codify that? We have yeah. to do some thought. I'm, I would just suggest yeah. this be a conversation that the finance committee have. And with the Christina, policy committee. maybe you join them, mm -hmm. Libby, yeah. and then come to the board with the, yeah. Yeah. here's what we've worked out and yeah. Yeah, that's yeah I was going to say policy or finance committee. Yeah. I also think there could be some sort of like threshold <clears throat> where, you know, like maybe there's like a discretionary sort of set aside where it's like up to this amount in any given year, you know, yeah. whatever you decide. And then after yeah. that, like maybe there's a dollar amount, 10000 or something like that. Yeah. I think that we hadn't considered. Yeah. And, and with some sort of report back. So we should probably yeah. put that to the policy or finance committee. Mia? I have a question related to the report. Mm -hmm. Did Christina say, or do you, maybe you know Libby, are we anticipating using the 400000 that we had set aside, saying that we had anticipate, budgeted to use from fund balance to cover expenses this year? Do you know if we're going to actually end up using it? That is typically decided at the audit time. Oh, when the audit, okay. Yeah, that's, that wouldn't be decided just yet. Okay. Christina might have a hunch that she said to the finance committee, I'm not sure, but that is typically decided once the audit has gone through. Okay. Which happens a few months after the end of the fiscal year, right? Right. It's, it, yeah. yeah, it's kind of ongoing from around now through the, the early fall. Okay. It came later this year because we got a new audit company. Right. It should come earlier next year. Okay. Um, and then the last page, um, which you folks should check out if you haven't already, is just a, the summary that's always helpful about the capital fund. So just, you know, replacements of things, you, the auditorium, things like that, those, um, those are documented there. And then food service um, is listed here. And we did follow up to our last board meeting. We had a discussion, at, or maybe it wasn't our last, last board meeting, but about why a food service entity at a school district has to be like an enterprise fund. And there was a very specific federal reason mm -hmm. that AOE gave our folks. Um, so while this says they would end the year with a surplus, that's not really true. <laughs> um, uh, we, but they are not going to need to dip into as much of the, um, we had allocated a certain amount of money for them to get to cover any deficit. Um, I think it was something about the reimbursement rate through COVID was really high, but that's not necessarily going to stay that way. Um, other funding, we again have another fantastic um, educator in the district who's been given a Rowland Foundation grant, um, Kiana Bromley. So that's documented there in addition to the ones no, that we've... Sam we've Bromley had. has it. Oh, is it Sam Bromley? Yeah, oh, Sam gosh. Has it. Yeah. I was like, My wait, apologies. did Kiana just get an award one? No, <laughs> Sam Bromley. <laughs> Thank you. Um, sorry, Sam. Um, <laughs> and then there's just the, the, oh, the continued summary of our long-term debt that just sort of shows out when our bonds are going to be paid. So that was it. And do we need to approve? approve it. Yes. Yes. So we're looking for a motion for the board to approve the FY23 third quarter report. So moved. Thank do you have you. a second? A second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? So I see a thumbs up from Scott. <laughs> I'm there. Lynn's on there too. Lynn? Did Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the report passes. Um, so we have a couple policy readings which don't require action, but they require discussion. Uh, we have uh, a second reading of a couple um, policies that the policy committee has worked on. Emma, or uh, I think I think it was Emma and Rhett that worked on these two. Um, Anything you want to report out about the changes? Well, when we had our first read, um, Libby had ended up having to be absent that night, and so and so part of what we wanted to get um, feedback on was the process by which we may end up engaging families around 
the adoption of this policy because because that's a requirement that's written into the policy. And um, I think Jim ended up emailing you mm -hmm. with those questions, and I have not had a time to read your answers. I apologize. Don't know if you did circle back, but maybe if we could, if you could just sort of quickly summarize that for the board. Yeah, I actually spoke to. Um, I know y'all were looking at Mrs. Coy Valley's and. Franklin Northeast yep. policy, which are two excellent policies to look at because um, after I received Jim's email and had a conversation with me and Jim after the last board meeting, I talked with both Julie and Lynn, who are the superintendents in those two districts, mm -hmm. um, and they went through uh, either a monitoring or audit around this around their Title I, and this policy was a part of it. Mm -hmm. And the actual model policy on the VSBA website, which they had followed, had inaccuracies according to the AOE's definition, the AOE's reading of the law around the policy. So the two policies from Franklin Northeast and Missisquoi are ones that they worked with the Agency of Education on and were approved by the Agency of Education. So we should really be looking at their policies as, as, the models. as models, yeah. Um, and I couldn't tell you what the difference was because right. we didn't get, have a chance to go into that level of detail. There has to be an app for that, right? <laughs> yeah. But those two, um, those two policies, and I've, I've looked at both of their policies, they're very similar, um, except their bullet points are different in how they engage families, um, are, are both really good examples, I think, from a lot of the things that we would do. The other things I noticed from Franklin Northeast and Missisquoi Valley were both were future written, and I think this is what I said to you. Um, so for instance, parents will be involved in the development of the LEA plan by, um, like that future language is very prominent in their policy. So um, the that is what I gathered from it as like your community can be involved in policy readings and policy development through this process. It's why we have three readings. It's why your practice is such. Um, and that the policy as written for gathering feedback is future forward. That That is done through the, you know, you hold the district accountable through the monitoring process. Am I making sense? I think what I'm gathering from you is that you feel that a, that a, that the three reads that are typical in a, a policy adoption process by the school board would be um, sufficient to adopt this policy, but then that moving forward, there would need to be uh, It's part of the policy right. of how the school More engagement yeah, with families. Yeah, how the school district um, engages families. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and the directive is to do the thing once the policy is in place. Yeah. yeah, that's the way yeah. it's written. And with this policy in particular, I would love for Mike and I to sit with um, the policy Thanks. committee to Let's make do. these bullets. <laughs> Let's do that. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Um, and do you just for like, I mean, we don't need to spend a ton of time on it, but how, but do you picture or did you talk to the other superintendents about what that process might look like in the future once we get there? Of engaging Title One families. Yeah, it's all in their policies. If you if you read through it. Yeah, the bullet. Um, yeah, points. the bullet points, and they're mm -hmm. different for each school district. And did um, those resonate with you as they were written for these other districts, or do yeah, you feel like you would yeah. probably change some of it? I think I think we would change we some of it. Borrow some of these, personalize some of these, yeah. and you put some of our own stamps on as well. Okay. Yeah. So I wonder if it would make sense just for like time uh, management for you and Mike to look at those yeah. bullet points and maybe draft them sure. and then bring your draft to the policy committee? Sure. Okay. Does that sound good to other, Scott, Rhett, yeah. Jim? Yeah, July 10th good. at four. Well, no, yeah, no, our no, next no, meeting no. is July 11th, 11th. Um, at four, if, if you're able to make that, but it's okay if we push that's it a, to a That's a, I'm just throwing around. Yeah. Yeah, that would be super Any further questions on title or E1, E1 Title I Part A Parent and Family Engagement? Would there be a way to notify families that are receiving Title I funding or supports, services, um, to be notified of like the third read, let's say? of this policy and like with the school board agenda would there be a way to like send an email to all of those families or is it just not that simple 
Um, maybe. <laughs> okay. Maybe. Um, because you're because we're we're not a consolidate we're not consolidated schools, we're targeted Title One, so we're talking about families who are qual who qualify with the economically disadvantaged or, and or homeless. So it's it's a very specific sector of family that um, I'm not positive if in power school with our blasts that we can pull specific pull family. families. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm not sure if we can do that. Because I just wonder how closely the majority of our constituents are following this process. And it would be great to just at least know that we reached out. Um, I think it would just be easier to send something to everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the three, three, uh, there's only three out of, or only three out of our four, four schools receive Title One dollars. So Union does not. Okay. I mean, that's something I would be interested in. I don't know how other people on the policy committee or the board feel about that. Mm -hmm. But well, is it beneficial for just anyone in our community to weigh in on this yeah, policy? Yeah, but it does, in the language of the policy does talk specifically True. about, you know, so it, it does feel like the spirit of the policy would be, I mean, I think you're right. Anytime we're, we're bringing up a policy for the, the reading process, it would be yeah. great to have like an extra little boost of PR around that happening um, so that everyone knows and, and can weigh in. Because um, you all could advertise the policy committee meeting that's happening yeah. on the 11th, and when this comes up for its next read at a board meeting, I could make it, when I do the front porch forum post, I could just highlight it as, this is, because I didn't today. I, I like included it in a list of things, but I could highlight yeah. it as like, oh, and by the way, here's the draft of the policy. Right. You the agenda on the 11th is is more about um, our plans for summer work and less about reviewing. Sure. Policies. So whatever it is, yeah. That you, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anything to note on C13? Um, I think, so we ended up sending, there was a mistake where I only sent one policy to the equity committee and then I was like, oh right, this was meant to be sent as well. Okay. So, um, but, and you looked at the, you looked at the um, discipline policy. C15. Yeah. We've gotten started. We have not okay. drafted anything yet. Yeah. That's our homework for next week. Great. Um, and so we all, we want to gather input, especially in particular on the statement of intent from the equity committee as well for C13. Um, the only comment I have on that one is, yep. is um, we want to put people first all the time. So there's a couple homeless student references, and we want to say students experiencing homelessness. Yeah, that, we made some of those changes, didn't we? Maybe not all mm, of them. The one I'm looking at, uh, like we said, students in a homeless situation up here. Academic well-being of any homeless student. Just, just always yes. remember to do the people first language as well. Yeah. Really Thank you. Other than that, I shared that statement of, Nick, of intent with Nick, and Nick said it looked great. Awesome. Thank you for doing that. And the first two definition defines homeless students. So. I know. So we struggle in the policy committee with these um, required policies these uh, by the VSBA because Pietro basically has asked us not to change them significantly, but that probably is one of those things that's not significant. Yeah. 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 Gotcha. Yeah, so Pietro was not a fan of the preamble either, or the statement of intent. Is that how he responded to our question? Yes. So we had reached out to Pietro right. about the statement of yeah. intents and like, surprised me. <laughs> yeah. and whether he felt like that was like a, an okay addition to required policies that we put sort of a value statement up front. Yeah. Sounds I've, like he's like, like, give, give yeah. a. He does not. He thinks it muddles things and potentially creates some rights or expectations that mm -hmm. the policy does not intend to create. Or, um, I mean, we don't. You don't have to listen to your lawyers, but that's what he says. <laughs> but we may be able to revise it yeah. to make it more focused so that it meets the spirit. Yeah. Of our intent and mm -hmm. does not overpromise. Yeah, I, mean, I think his answer would be like the the intent of the policy should kind of speak for itself and what it requires. I wonder if he could take a look at this one in particular, 
because this one, so this statement of intent was drafted by Bridget and, um, and Ryan, Ryan yeah. and me and Amanda it, before, so a while ago, most, mostly, and then we sort of um, finessed it in the, yeah. this new version of the policy committee. So I wonder, because it is pretty lengthy and wordy, I wonder if this one might be a good one to give to Pietro to see if he has like specific pullouts. Like this is something that I would really want you to look at removing. Yeah, I would prefer Which, to keep it. Sorry, C13 students yeah. who are homeless. I'd prefer to keep it with Pietro's blessing. Just because I feel like the intent of that portion is to make it easily digestible for everybody out there. Like yeah. I, my my eyes go blurry as soon as I jump into legal yeah. ease or right. tax forms. You know. Agreed. Right. So. That was part of the impetus behind adding yeah. it to the policies. Um, another I mean, question we, is: we Are could put disciplinaries on our side that they do not create any rights or mm -hmm. start it with some legal ease? Well, we could end it with legal ease. <laughs> Well, it also could explain that this policy is a required policy by law, right? So like that, could, yeah. I think the disclaimer doesn't sound like a bad idea. But also if you could ask Pietro, if that, do you feel like I, that's I, an okay piece of Pietro's time to like look at this draft? Just I, I could definitely go back to him and not, not ask. I mean, this is, this is the one he looked at, so. Um, Okay, the other question is, so this is a required policy, it's a model policy, we start with the model policy from the VSBA. It, the title is students who are homeless. Should we consider as a district retitling it, students experiencing homelessness? No, students who are homeless is, is okay. That's fine. Okay. Because it's, it's the student who's first, right? Not the homeless like identifier. Homeless in front of students, yeah. yeah. It's just like we want to say it's special education legal. student. Okay. The student first. Right, but they aren't homeless. That's not their identity. Exactly. They're experiencing it. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm just wondering if we should change that. I wouldn't since it's required by law. Okay. <laughs> Any other feedback from board members? And then next we have a first reading of two policies which are required and which we have to adopt by the end of August, mm -hmm. right? Uh, technically in the law, August 1st. Mm -hmm. um, they have told us, superintendents, that by, we should try our hardest to get the policies adopted prior to the start of the school year. So we also have learned that we actually do not have to have three readings as a practice. We just need it. 10 days. 10 days. So um, we could we could adopt these at our retreat in April and the... You mean July? July, whatever. Um, <laughs> Jim's going back in time. Yeah. <laughs> we could do it in April, too. We'd be out of compliance, <laughs> but we could do it in April. Um, and have them ready by August. Yeah, there's not a lot of wiggle room for you yeah. here. This is recent legislation. The govern yeah. governor is very much behind these two policies in particular and what they say. There's not, there's really no wiggle room for the board on these, so... We can't write a statement of intent and take three <laughs> months to do it. I will let the board decide if they we want to spend their time writing statements. Yeah. Like it's one of those yeah. things yeah. that we could add later. It's true. Um, so I, the policy committee, was Scott kindly went through and, and changed all the wording that needed to be changed, like the fill in the blanks things. But other than that, we did nothing yeah. to these model policies. So it's exactly the way that they're recommending that we adopt them. And Actually, I think. Actually, Oh. The versions that are in our board packet are not the ones that we um, we tweaked in our last meeting. Oh, did it not make it in? Because I had I had put in some suggested changes, um, and they're not there. Oh, it's probably that thing where if they're attached, you know what I mean. Like you need to have edit access to be able to see the. Well, the board packet has them all as PDFs. Right, so you can't then see the suggested edits in right. this mode. The link from the agenda is to the Word document. Oh, great. Does that have the changes? It, it says Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools. 
the top. But it doesn't have any suggested edits. I don't see any, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Scott, are you seeing Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools in the version that you're opening? Yes. And then you made additional suggested edits. Yeah, the, the, the one ounce of wiggle room that we had in, in uh, F4 um, around the, um, like, outbuildings, okay. none of that's in there. Okay. Could you just maybe give a quick summary of that so we can state that it was publicly disclosed? Also, I don't have edit access, so I can't make a comment, but it, whoever does have edit access in this room, maybe you could make a comment with Scott's suggested edit, and that way we can bring it forward to be adopted at the yeah. retreat. So Scott, did you, are you talking about 2A, where it says optional? Yes. What what is the, what's the what's change? The edit? Yeah, I recall it was quite brief. Why am I not seeing it? <laughs> oh, I know because I'm on the wrong policy. The only structure I can think for educational reasons that would be remain unlocked is the the. Um, Green, the green, no, the greenhouse back here. That's a student accessible piece of, you know, structure. So, Libby, I think our suggested edit was something like the district recognizes the need to leave certain outbuilding structures unlocked as needed. So that would give you and Andrew and Andrew, whoever, the sort of wiggle room to, like, if mm -hmm. you needed to leave the shed near the bleachers for right, because athletic no purposes lawn, yeah. unlocked, or if you yeah. needed to leave. I know there's one at the middle school where kids leave their skis if you needed to leave that unlocked on a Wednesday night for the Bolton Valley program. You know what yeah. I mean? That we would, that would give you the leverage to be able to do that. You wouldn't be out of compliance with the policy. Right. So I'm just adding that in. Yeah. 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 And <coughs> it's not appearing on the Google Docs that we can see just because we don't have edit access, but that's fine. We know okay. what you're doing. And was that it, Scott? Was that the only change? Yeah. yeah he's one. nodding. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Great. All right, so we can um, revisit those at the retreat and the mod, and then if we want to, you know, deal with them later, we can. Amendment them. Um, Moving on to the policy monitoring report. Uh, uh, do I have a motion to approve the policy monitoring for C2 student alcohol and drugs? So moved. Oh, second. I second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, and then finally, motion to adjourn. Second. All second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.